Hello and welcome to the Fully Charged Show pod. Now, I don't want to walk, go on too long right now uh, because this is quite a long episode and it's a really interesting conversation that I had with an uh, old friend of Fully Charged, Roger Atkins, from Electric Vehicles Outlook. Uh, Roger knows a thing or a thousand about electric vehicles. He's just an extraordinary fountain of knowledge and understanding. He's talked to everyone in that in the uh, uh, auto, electric automotive industry and and their aunties. Amazing man. Um, so I'm just going to quickly say hello to everyone. So glad you joined us. Please do subscribe to this podcast because it just keeps going. And lots of people are listening to it, which is really encouraging. Uh, and that's all really I want to say. And I will join you at the end for a quick uh, update and, uh, the, and that sort of thing. But anyway... Let's get on with it straight away. Please welcome to the Fully Charged Show podcast, Roger Atkins, founder of Electric Vehicles Outlook Limited. My Energy is putting the I back into British innovation. My Energy is putting the I back into inventing the future. My energy is putting the eye back into inspiring a nation. Recharging the world with green smart energy. Charge your EV with your PV and more. Visit myenergy.com and help to spark the green revolution. My energy, driving the charge to a greener future. Nissan Aria, which I did, I remember mentioned it on the news because it sounds really good. I haven't heard anything from Nissan directly, but the whole point was, and this was sort of like whenever it came out six months ago, was that it would be made in in the UK. It would be made up in Sunderland. And they just announced today that they're going to make it in Japan. They're not making it here because they can't import it into Europe from here. They, it's too risky for them to make the investment to start it. It's a great shame. But, you know, it's like a lot of things that happen in life, you know, in personal life or, you know, the life of the country in this case. Yeah. Um, if you can do something about it, then, then, yeah, try and do it. But if you can't, the best thing to do is to look for the kind of antidote to it. Look for ways in which you can um, encourage investment elsewhere and make other yeah. things ha happen. You know, and, and I think the, the, the way in which, you know, over time... Um, Oh, hang on. I need to turn this phone off. Sorry, Rob. That's all right. But um, yeah, no, you're right. I mean, in the sense that there are other things happening in this country that, that might mitigate. I mean, just it's heartbreaking because, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've been around that factory. I mean, that's an amazing facility at, at Nissan up in Sunderland. It's, I've been there a couple of times. And it's yes, just, it is. And it, you know, it, it is. But, you know, let's reflect on what we've got in this country. We have got an extraordinary skill set of people in and around academia yeah. who are quite commercial. They can understand how to kind of hook up with um, the business people. Uh, we've got now increasingly organizations that actually do work. Things like the Faraday Institute. Yeah. And I mentioned the BIC, you know, which is going to be coming on Stream Battery Innovation Center. Um, and, you know, a number of things which are, I'll be honest with you, in the past I've disparagingly called quangos, you know, because it's a bit like they're just money pits of not yeah. much that comes out the other end. But increasingly those things are now joining up. They are triggering investment. They are making things happen. Yeah. I do think we'll get two or three gigafactories here over the next you know year to 18 months announced obviously british vault made their announcement yeah the that was day. good that was a good bit of news yeah yeah I, you know i'd be very surprised and, and listen at any point i'm not going to talk about anything i have as privileged information because like you if you're told things in confidence that's yeah, what you're you told and you can't yeah. talk about them so this is a speculative thought i can't imagine that jlr won't build a gigafactory here right um I think in regard to, you know, w w where they're going, you know, Jaguar and Land Rover and where they're going, you know, maybe with other things that, that they're doing, partnerships that, you know, all in the public domain, like they have with um, Waymo and other people like that. I can't yeah. see why they wouldn't uh, build a gigafactory. And of course, you know, the mothership is Tata and yeah. uh, pretty epic uh, company, not that JLR is small. Yeah. Um, so I think there are encouraging signs and there are things that, that will happen here. And because we've got this heritage of um, motorsport capability and we connect up, you know, 
centres of excellence in, in like Oxford, Cambridge, London. There's that triangle. I don't know what they call it, but there's a name for no. it. But I mean, the fact that Milton Keynes, I'm always staggered by what goes on around the Milton Keynes, because you just think Milton Keynes is just a shopping centre and a funny ski, <laughs> indoor ski slope. It's an absolute epicentre of technical innovation and small factories and all the Formula One, all the Formula One workshops are there. It's where they make Formula One cars. It's always a... I always forget, you know. Well, exactly. And there's a reason why Formula One's been so, you know, dominant um, or, or, or it's dominant here in the UK is because of the talent. Yeah. And not only that, but you then also have, you know, a nascent, well, not nascent, certainly for EV, it's nascent to some extent. But you have a supply chain that supports Formula One that um, has people who are really innovative, cutting edge technologies, all of those sort of things, whether it's in, you know, body and light weighting or, or you know, other aspects of, of where we're going with with electrification that fit together quite nicely so yeah it, it's it's we've got a lot more going for us i think than we realize and i think given what's going on at the moment with the um the b word the b word we should focus on isn't the one that you hear on the news every day the b word we should focus on is batteries yes so it's certainly a lot it makes me a lot happier <laughs> yeah yeah because it will trigger a lot of innovation and jobs yeah. in this country so you know what's not to like about that yeah yeah because that actually the other story which i do think is really worth mentioning i'm just making sure i'm looking it up and making sure i've got it right is the the about the battery cost report um yeah so sub 100 dollars yes. uh, yeah ki kilo hour yeah yes so, I mean, and it is, I just think it's fascinating that that, that does exist because that was, I remember hearing that, I'm sure you heard it years ago. Once batteries go under $100 per kilowatt hour, you know, that's the tipping point. But what is interesting is they have done, but it's very specifically for, for buses in China. It's not, it's not cars yet. But, well, uh, well, I'm quite glad about that, Rob. You, you know my mantra, which is becoming almost like a fetish rather than a, a <laughs> mantra, that, you know, electric buses and taxis and vans are what we, we yes. should and must see lots so of. So important, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. you go to any town or city, you know, the things that are still too many of them, diesel, etc., are those buses yeah. and, and taxis, yeah. etc. And, and vans, I think if yeah. we'd taken a leaf out of, um, obviously not the Nissan leaf, um, yeah. taken a leaf out of the the, the Chinese authorities book and focus much more on electrifying bus fleets and the like we would have done a lot more good to to where we are oh there is yeah. one thing I definitely want to talk about um yeah. but we'll, we'll come to that in a bit I'll, I'll nudge you on it when I think it's okay. an appropriate moment but um but, but, but yeah I mean, I it's good news look you know yeah, batteries yeah. It, it's the more we make the more they know the more they do the, the, I wouldn't say the easier it gets no. but, but uh, the better at it the world the world gets yeah because I mean, I think that because I mention that all the time, but I mean, it is a I think it's an important thing to kind of remind our wonderful listeners and they'll probably know it and they'll be bored me. So I'll do it very quickly. But it was it is the case that in 2010, which is when fully charged started, it was about eleven hundred to twelve hundred dollars a kilowatt hour to battery pack cost, not the cells, but the back the pack. That's what it costs to make one kilowatt hour of storage. And it's now about one hundred and thirty. So it's dropped some, I think it's in there, about 89% reduction over 10 years. And at the moment, that hasn't tailed off. But there's, I've heard two arguments about, well, it will. It's not going to get much cheaper. It's not going to kind of go down to $10 a kilowatt hour. It's going, it could go down to 90 so, you know, much, so much lower. Well, well, yes and no. And I don't want to be a contrarian, just to sound like I'm doing it for the sake of it. But if you think of, you know, what dictates the price of anything was supply and demand, yeah. you know, predominantly. Um, and so to date, we haven't had necessarily a massive demand for some of the fundamental elements that make up the batteries. Yeah. Um, you know, nickel, uh, manganese, cobalt, not, not just lithium. Yeah. Um, and if you think about it logically, if then there is a finite capability of delivery of those, those minerals, both because, you know, the, the, you, know you, can't, you can't take everything out of the ground forever, that's, yes. you know it's the same argument we've all made about oil of course yes absolutely um, yeah. but the point being the mining of minerals and the processing of those minerals takes time to set up yeah and you know the equation around have we got enough to make enough evs you've heard that said many times well the answer to that question really is it depends you know because it depends 
what is the cadence of the adoption of, of EVs. And one of the scenarios that might put, put that price back up, Rob, is if the demand you know, for these, these fundamental um, minerals goes up so much and the capacity to deliver it isn't there, yeah. by definition, the price will go up. Yeah. Yeah. Because wh why wouldn't those people charge more if they've got, you know, more customers they can cope that with? they can cope with, yeah. Yeah, so I, I don't think it's necessarily the reduction in battery price something that is an absolute given and can only and will only go down. You know, right. things in, typically can't go up and down. That's sort of how it yeah. works, isn't it? But it is, I mean, it is the mystery for me, which I've, I think I've waffled about a bit, but it is the fact that, it's so hard to know because the economics of the automotive industry are so complex and so multi-layered and there's so many aspects in, of it. But the simple fact of the matter is, you know, like if I go back 11, 12 years to my Mitsubishi iMeve, which I think was £36,000, I think that's what it's, its price was, which had an 18 kilowatt hour battery and everyone around and the Mitsubishi people said it's because of the battery. You know, and I remember looking underneath that car and they took the, the little plate off that protected where, and the motor and the drive system was so simple. It was just a motor with two shafts coming out, going go to the back wheels. And then, you know, the, the battery management system was not an expense even then, but the battery was this phenomenal thing. 18 kilowatt hours then would be a, about 18,000 pounds more because yes. of the cost of the batteries. But, You're right, because if you recall, I was at Modec at a similar time. Yeah. And so we had a 55 kilowatt hour battery pack, um, which is LFP, by the way, right. lithium ion phosphate. And I remember, I think that was around 30,000 pounds. Wow. Just the battery pack. Yeah. Yeah. So the vehicle was like 50 odd grand and you'd go and see somebody who could buy a five and a half ton, you know, GVW uh, truck for say 20 odd grand, 25 grand. Yeah. Uh, and you'd say, Oh yes, look, it's the future. Get one of these. And they say, yeah. how much are they? And you'd tell them and they just, they'd really laugh. It was like yeah, you told sure. them a really funny joke. They couldn't stop laughing. No. Yeah. But I mean, <laughs> that, cause that would mean though now on these prices, it, let's say 120 quid, $120 a kilowatt hour, an 18 kilowatt hour battery is now going to cost about £2,000. Whereas it well, was £38,000 or whatever it was, you know, a huge amount. Yeah, listen, I'm, I'm not great at maths. No, I'm not good. But I mean, it's, either it's, well, it's, this is a disaster. Two blokes not good at maths yeah. trying to work out how much something is. <laughs> but what is interesting is that you now can spend, you know, there's, there isn't a £10,000 electric car on sale in the UK with a small battery, you know, there, it just doesn't, hasn't happened yet. There's some that are around sort of 22 to 25,000, but of course they've got much bigger batteries. That's, you know, so it's that, it, 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 what, I'm, what I want, here's my question. Is it possible for the larger automotive, established legacy automotive manufacturers to gently increase the price of their electric vehicles uh, and thereby protecting the sales and the attractiveness of their existing uh, manufacturing capacity to make diesel and petrol engines, which is what they've been doing for the last hundred years. Yeah, it's a really good question, Rob. I, I, they could. I we can know. I think we can't. Yeah, can we? I think they could, but I don't think they will. Yeah. Because I, I, I think we are, you know, the, the term tipping point, you know, um, again, it, it depends what you mean by tipping point. Is it an emotional tipping point? Is it a legislative tipping yeah. point? Is it a technical tipping point? You know, th there are different tipping points in this whole uh, journey. One of the key ones, though, that I would definitely highlight is um, the one around research and, and development, the one around engineering ever greater capability in an internal combustion engine to deliver sub 100 grams a kilometer in terms of um, emissions. Yeah. Uh, it's getting so expensive to develop that capability and technology that you might as well just go to the end game and make EVs. Yeah. And this is a conclusion now that I think many of the OEMs have got to. And if you add into that, you know, the timelines on the end of uh, internal con uh, internal combustion engine production, you, you can see how and there's an alignment now of both legislation, technology, just reality, you know, just, yeah. just cost benefit analysis that, that means that, that people are going to switch that way. And if they don't, someone else will. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think that's the, that's, I wouldn't call it a dawn of realization. I think it's been well known for some time, but I, I, I think 
I think people are, are doing that thing where, I'm, again, I'm going to sound boring. If people listening to this have thought, oh, God, he always trots that out. Um, <laughs> I, I make no apology, really. Yeah. Um, a German economist called Rudiger Dornbusch is famous for saying, things take longer to change than you thought they would, and right. then things change quicker than you thought they could. Right, yes. Yeah. And if you put that through the lens of the automotive industry, the great danger for them is they are pacing themselves for a kind of evolution of the electric vehicle coming in and a nice balanced removal of their internal combustion engine business yeah. model and capability, yeah, yeah. and that it's kind of on their terms, on their kind of timeline, and then suddenly it isn't, and it's like all hell breaks loose. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think this is the kind of nightmare scenario for them, is that if tomorrow morning a lot of people wake up and say, I don't want a petrol car or a diesel yeah. car, I, I want one of these electric things. Yeah. And um, if that starts to happen in big numbers, there's going to be a real problem because it's a bit like who's in charge of the switch to electrification? Who's yeah. in charge of it? Is it governments? Is it, you know, it, people like you that, you know, do stuff on, on and, and influence people? Yeah. It, the truth is, it's lots of those things. Yeah. Um, but but the, the problem for the, the OEMs is how do they, how do they, manage or prepare for and deliver a, you know that managed transition for their yeah. business it's um complex, isn't it? I mean, it's yeah I, I know they get poked in the eye with a sharp stick a lot but i do actually genuinely have a bit of sympathy for them oh i have um, huge sympathy it's really difficult i mean even if you're being uh, uh, cynical and doing our oh, diesel gate you know I mean, it's, it's fairly easy there's been some fairly colossal colossal blunders but still to transform a you know hugely complex global industry that has been established. And, you know, when I, I do remember once asking, I think, it, I don't think it was VW, it might have been VW, but asking, you know, someone in a fairly high managerial position, you would know who they were, of course, I can't remember. Uh, you know, you know, you've probably got 5,000 people making engines in some factory. And he said, well, we've got, we've got 10,000 in Brazil and 22,000 in Germany. I think it was VW. You know, that's no, their I job. They don't make cars, they make engines. Rob, can I tell you I think it was? And I yeah, remember yeah. at the time watching this and being incredibly impressed by what you were doing. And if I'm also honest, a bit envious. <laughs> you were sat in the back of a car with Carlos Ghosn oh, driving yeah. to Heathrow Airport. Yeah. No, I was driving. No, I was. Dri I was sitting in the front with him. I was driving him there. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that's right. And because yeah. this is something a lot of people don't know. The reason why you got into EVs is because you used to be Carlos Ghosn's chauffeur. And um... <laughs> I think that's the story I'm going to go with. <laughs> yeah. I managed to put him in a box and get him out of Japan, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> <laughs> Such oh, an that's... extraordinary story. Is that, 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 I do. I'd love to interview him now. And, you know, get him to, can you get back in the box so we can see how you did? Because it's such an extraordinary tale, but we've got to go yeah. to do it. Yeah. Um, Rob, it's this time of year where I'm sat here in my office and I can see the garden gate and all the rest of it. Right. And I now see um, the guy from the, the, the courier's just arrived. And he's about to go and the dogs will bark right. any minute now. And I will need to go and get the package. Right. Can you no, just bear with me? Absolutely. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Right, Rob, I'm back now. That's right. That's good. That's good. And I've just had a thought. Oh, yeah. Um, I've seen videos on YouTube where, where people do a thing called unboxing. Oh, have yeah. Have you seen that? Yeah. <laughs> I did. Well, I did. I, did, I have actually recorded, and we've never put it out. Me, un is the, I was so excited. It was during full heavy duty lockdown, and I ordered a solar pond pump. Wow. Because we've that got sounds... a pond that I say, and I'm pretty sure I'm right, but my wife slightly disagrees with me, that I've got a pond that I made for the children. So we'd ha they'd have fishes and they could sail their model boats and all that. My wife says I, I had a pond for me. It's like, it's like when someone has a really big model railway and they said, I, I got this for the kids. The kids aren't the slightest bit interested. But yeah. anyway, I, re I reformed my old pond that had completely filled in and grow overgrown over decades. And uh, got it back, and it's now got a pond, a solar pond pump, little waterfall, lovely fish swimming around, it's lovely. But well, I well, unboxed, that, I unboxed that pond pump. You, you now need to put that out because people will be intrigued. Um, it is, yeah, it's very cute. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. But, so but, yeah, so sorry about that little yeah. interruption. It's part of um, yes. how it how it goes this time of year. Um, can we talk for a moment about um, something that that is incredibly poignant? Uh, sad but it does herald potentially an enormous change now you have for many years i know you have because like lots of people listening followed what you've 
what you've been saying and what you've done. And the issue around, um, well, the twin imperative of reducing CO2 and improving air quality yeah. has been, you know, something you, you've, you're a real champion of and, and a real exemplar of getting stuff done. So yesterday when, when the high court oh, yeah. finally for the first time for that young girl, Ella Kissy Deborah, because that was the next story I was going to bring up. Uh, well, really you know, with... w when you think about it, um, for the number of people over time that have, you know, sadly got ill and died, yeah. um, for this to be the first occasion where that is actually officially the case linked to um, is extraordinary. And yeah. it is a bit like, it did seem to me a bit like a moment where, and I, I won't know the person, but with, um, uh, with asbestos yeah. and yeah. probably with cigarettes yep. and, and a exactly few other same. things which... For many, many years, lobbyists and other people said, no, 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 they're fine. It's yeah. okay. It's yeah. not a problem. Um, but I think we need to have a balanced, not discussion, but we need to have, we need to deal with this uh, appropriately. It will trigger a lot of issues um, and they won't all necessarily be positive. Um, but for her mother to have, you know, pursued this in the way that she has with the dignity that yeah. she has, you know, it, it's astonishing. Yeah. And yeah. I think... Without and it all sound like hyperbole saying it like this, but I think that young girl's sad and short tra tragic life will go down in history as a moment in time where we really do have an, another one of these. We talked to them earlier. It tipping oh. points. So but, I mean, I just kind of want to ex explain because I mean, it, this has been a big story in the UK the last certainly this week, hasn't it? But I'm just for yes. people overseas. So there was a, a a very young girl. I think she was nine when she passed away. Beautiful young kid. Uh, who lived on a, a, in a house very near the, the South Circular, which is a, there's a sort of inner circular road around in London, very very busy road. So a busy kind of it's not a highway, it's not like a freeway. It is it is a ground level, very very busy road. I've I've got we've all sat on the South Circular at some time in the with, you know with our engines running. So this kid grew up very near there. Uh, she developed asthma. She w didn't develop it when she was a tiny child. It was when she was about eight, seven or eight. Well, I think and it was going to school, Rob. I think yeah, it was, was going to school. So she was breathing in. Uh, and the, the, the thing I remember hearing about very soon after that case was a couple of doctors who looked at her uh, periods of crisis when she was taken to hospital with breathing problems. She was on ventilators, which we now know a lot more about that. She was on ventilators at the age of seven, eight, nine mm -hmm. years old. Um, uh, uh, but that her cr crisis uh, uh, events where she had real trouble breathing matched perfectly to very high pollution events. And mm. that was what was really shocking. Now, this has been investigated now for years, isn't it? Because I can't remember when she died. It was 2013. Yeah, seven uh, yeah, years so ago. So seven years ago, she mm. died. And it's taken that long for her extraordinary mother, who's a teacher who slowly kind of just very very dedicatedly pursued this connection that she felt was there a lot of people denied it and it's now been found to be it's it's uh, you know there's a, um uh, the dangerous levels of air pollution made a material contribution to the death of the nine-year-old in london in 2013 the, the london coroner has ruled now that's the first time i think that's the important thing it's a landmark result it's the first time this has happened in our legal history that that's been the case, which is, you know, I've sort of, because I've hesitated to mention it, like when I do talks and stuff about air pollution and what it does to us, because I don't, I don't know about the science. And also I, it hadn't been fully accepted. So I didn't want to talk about it. It's now been fully accepted. It's, it's, it's in a way it's that, it's that depressing, uh, what's that called? You know, where you don't want that proof. <laughs> but it does prove the point. And in the same way, like Dieselgate, I just went, I don't believe that these cars are as clean as they say. And then you find out, oh, they're not. <laughs> mm. And then you go, I don't believe a child with asthma that, 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 that where their crisis periods correlate with very, very high levels of, of toxic air pollution aren't connected. And then you find out, oh, they are connected. Yes, just... Yes. That, but, but it doesn't give you any pleasure because it's the life of a little kid. It's just, you know, and I think if you've got children, and you see pictures of this little kid. And I remember when my daughter was that age, you know, to lose a child at that age, just, just don't want to think about it. I mean, it's really horrifying. Yes, it is. But, but like we were saying earlier about, you know, other things that happen in, in, in the world, 
it's about focusing and trying to make something good come yeah, out of it. Yeah, you absolutely. know, clearly that is what her mother's intention has been. And there will be cynical people all say, oh, this is all about trying to get compensation or all that. So you will inevitably get yeah. that kind of um, that kind of narrative yeah. from some of it. But the reality is, you know, if you if you come down to looking at how many people have suffered ill health, uh, yeah. uh, perhaps less so this year because people yeah. haven't been driving around, but yeah. but but in a typical year, uh, and indeed the number of um, associated deaths. When you look at what we've had to do this year with a global pandemic, yeah. and I make no, you know, you you could never make light of deaths, but you know we've had just over fifty thousand people die this year, and and the consequence of all that has been. You know, extraordinary. Yeah. And um, well, that that's not a great number more than the apparently I'm yeah. told uh, is my understanding, and I can't quote the, the the source of the facts, but similar numbers are the sorts of people who are being impacted by carcinogens, particulates of two point five microns that get into the lung and the bloodstream, and yeah. the people who are susceptible to it then get ill and die. Yeah. Well, you know, if we've got an alternative, as we have now and we can accelerate that alternative quicker yeah. and we could and should then then you know that this that's what we have to do we yeah. just have to get on with it um i heard uh, i'm just gonna have a little bit of a moan about our wonderful because generally i'm a massive supporter wonderful bbc but i did i've been very astutely avoiding news recently just because it's so depressing and that you're not really learning anything you know there's a pandemic okay yeah i kind of got, i understand that but anyway i did listen to a bit this morning in reference to this story that the interviewer on the bbc sort of morning radio show was saying was talking about this story and they had uh, uh, a child health specialist who is explaining what happens to children when they have asthma and they get this and what the particulates do, all the things we just, you've just been mentioning, the, you know, the, two, the, the 2.5 particulates, all that stuff. Hmm. And this woman kept saying, so that's really from break dust. And you go, wow, that's extraordinary. That's that, hmm. that. And then he goes, and the guy, thankfully, the doctor said, well, break dust is certainly one of the things we're looking into, but it's, it's diesel and petrol fumes. He said, yes, but the break dust is, is bad, isn't it? And you go, they are, they, you, you know, because I, I, <laughs> I'm just paranoid and suspicious that there is an agenda at the BBC, uh, uh, particularly for the uh, morning news show about. Well, that Rob, stuff, Rob, you know. I, I, of course, I've heard, I've heard this a lot, and I know even as far back six, seven, eight years ago when I was at Ricardo, uh, we, we were looking at then, you know, scoping and looking at. Uh, countermeasures for the issues with, with brake dust but yeah. again you, you know having had evs for such a long time yeah. well, um, we don't wear brake, brake wear yeah. is substantially less because you're yeah. using the motor as a dynamo you're using regen to break the car uh, to slow the car down yeah. so actually even if you said yes this is an issue well on an ev it's, it's far less, less of an issue, issue than it is on a combustion engine yeah. car so Yes, we have to deal, do something about it, yeah. but nonetheless, you know, there you go. You've got to yeah. measure apples with apples. Yeah. By the way, I'm, I'm having a very decadent afternoon. All right. We're recording this Thursday afternoon. It's, yeah. what is it, 10 to 4. And look, I, I'm just going for it, mate. I've got, um, got a lovely ginger beer, Rob. Oh. <laughs> I thought it didn't look like whiskey. No, but do you know what? It, do you know what it does look like? I used to live in a squat um, back in the early eighties, and the water that came out of the tap Looks used to be like that, that colour. I've lived in houses like that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's certainly a, a topic that we're going to look into in great detail. We've it's a it's a very contentious issue about tyre particulates, which is you know it's it's one of those things. It's a bit like I never thought about where petrol came from until I bought an electric car. And I went, oh, you know, because immediately you go, well, where's well, about electricity? It comes from coal, you know, all those things. I'm talking 12 yeah. years ago. And then I went, oh, but where does petrol come from? You know, it comes from the petrol station, the gas station where you buy it and you moan about how much it costs. And, you know, that's, that's it, really. Uh, I never thought about the journey that, that there is for that stuff. And in a similar way, I've like, oh, I've got to buy new tires because they're worn down. Well, where did they wear down on the road? Well, where did the bits go that came off? Yeah. I don't know. Never thought about it. And, you, you know, obviously, if you wear a tyre down, that tyre has to go somewhere. Yes. You know, those bits. Uh, and now, of course, there are, we now know there are microplastics and particulars. That, I mean, I think the big danger with them, it's less, in this country, it's less you're inhaling them. It's more they get washed into the water. You know, they get washed away by rain. 
Yeah. They go into our water system and then they go, then do we drink them? Then we're in just, you know, it's, that's a seriously mm -hmm. big problem. And at the moment that isn't resolved one way or the other by electric vehicles, just a sheer tonnage of vehicles on the road, trucks in particular. Well, you, you just made a really good point there. And I think this is something that is, it's useful to frame perhaps um, the amount of things on the road. It, yeah. It's about scale and volume. You know, you and I are, are, are of an age where we grew up in the 50s, 60s, whatever. Back at that time, there were far fewer people on the planet anyway. Yeah. And of the people that there were, we had much less stuff. Yeah. You know, when I was growing up, the street where I lived, long street called College Road, well, it was a road, not a street. Um, I don't know, there were four or five cars. Um, right. The people that had cars, you know, someone who was a doctor or someone who was yeah. whatever. I mean, my dad was a lovely man, a carpenter and joiner. You know, he couldn't afford a car right. um, until, I don't know, late 60s, early 70s. Yeah. But the point I'm making is that the, the things that in the past of themselves weren't necessarily bad, um, even, dare I say, things like petrol cars, diesel cars and all that stuff, because there was fewer of them, yeah. they weren't an issue. So what's happened over time with the number of people we have now on the planet and the fact we are all consumers with all these things, yeah. all that stuff now has a different consequence than it had in the past. Yeah. So when people get all excited and say, oh, God, here we go, ban this, do that, who are you? You know, <laughs> I want to drive a car, shut yeah. up, you're such a killjoy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It isn't because these things have, have, have necessarily become bad. It's, they are, it's because of their scale. Yeah. As, as you mentioned a moment ago, the sheer volume of traffic. Yeah. You know? So I, I think people, it's important to understand that. And again, when you were, we were born, I was born in 1959. I guess you're 1950-something as well. 56, um, a bit, yeah, a bit older. Yeah. I don't know what it was, um, but I would imagine the parts per million of carbon in the air were probably 200 and something. And yeah. now they're oh, 450 well, parts in, in per million. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, the consequence of that has yet really to be truly seen, but is already happening in terms of well, all the things that we keep hearing about, yeah. which I, I don't want to make light of by saying it like that, but, you know, we are in that, what they call it, last chance saloon. Yeah. We, yeah. we really are. Yeah. Um, so we've got to get on with getting these things fixed. And, and for me, going back to the vehicle thing, it's always been the twin imperative, reduce CO2, improve air, local air quality. Yeah. And the two things kind of go together. They do. But they absolutely you know, do. Yeah. Well, and I think, but this is where we got all mixed up with diesel. Um, the focus of politicians and other people was to focus on um, making diesel attractive, taxation-wise, etc. Was because yeah. it, it produced, it was more efficient and produced, it produced uh, lower CO2. CO2. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, great. What about the other bit? You know, yes. it wasn't a very sophisticated judgment. It was, <laughs> it was all a bit. Not. Yeah, it was all a bit one-sided. You've got to think that there were, you know, it's one of the another one of those things where it would be so advantageous to have a few MPs few politicians who had a science background. I mean, it's very difficult to say, I find it difficult to say, but Margaret Thatcher had a science background. She read the papers about climate change. She didn't go, well, that's fake. It's fake news. You know, she went, this is a problem. We've got to do something. The amazing speech she made at the UN about it. You know, she was a scientist. She understood peer reviewed research. Yes, I, 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 I've heard that speech of hers. And, and yeah, for sure, I wouldn't necessarily um, <laughs> give her a pass for many other things that, that yeah. happened you know you, you know you you can't just ignore that and then the other bit if you go to china so i think i might be wrong but xi jinping is a chemist or, or a geologist yes, he he, he's certainly one of those two yeah. and most of the leaders that they've had in china not that they've had that many yeah. um the last few years they are people uh, with an academic background and a yeah. sound understanding of the science and yeah. therefore their political decisions are science biased yeah. rather than in many other place, parts of the world, you know, science doesn't come into play. It's all about how good you look, how funny are you, and, you know, how, yeah. how amazing can you give speeches? You know, yes. it's just not good enough, really. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, the, the, a story I'd love to... There's two other stories I'd love to get, you, get your take on, particularly the, the, the one about VW. Because I think, I mean, that my neighbour now has an ID3. So I see one every day. She drives past. She absolutely, she's gone into a complete different world. She just loves it. She's obsessed. <laughs> and it does look very nice when she drives. But it's already filthy and muddy because where we live is so dirty. 
and there's another one in there's someone else who's got one in a nearby town where they so you're kind of suddenly seeing these cars popping up they're very popular but the, it's the story about uh the, the uh, herbert deese oh, i don't know how you say his name is it deese or dice no deese that's deese. it yeah but that he has sort of won the battle that's going on in, at the moment he's won the battle that's going on within vw that there is it, i would say profound resistance for them going more electric well within the within the vw group but his He's basically the board have supported him. He's because I'd heard recently he was going to be kicked out, and well, he's been I, a real driving force behind EVs, hasn't he? At, at Volkswagen, absolutely, yes. And of course, he's ex BMW, of course, right. and, and came in to do a particular job. And BMW had that leadership with electrification, of course, yeah. but then that was kind of you know, not stymied that would be unfair to say, but slowed down right. because when. Uh, and you can understand this to a certain extent, the shareholders and other people looked at what was happening with these, these amazing EVs and innovative technology that BMW was progressing was they were losing money on everything they sold. Right. And you kind of think, okay, yeah, well, let's make more of those and eventually we'll go out of business. Yeah. Um, so, so they kind of, you know, slowed, slowed down. Um, and, and he's come from that sort of background. Um, my understanding of this story, Rob, is that it's about the union. So, IG Metal, which is an incredibly powerful union in Germany, it's a bit like right. the Teamsters either right. were or maybe still are in America, that um, they wield a lot of influence, political influence, right. social influence even. And as you will probably know, since about 1947, uh, the, the, in the German economy, all companies have to have workers on the, on the board of management. Right. Um, and this has worked in their favor for decades. It's been a very good way of managing relationship between unions uh, and and uh, and management workers and management, right. um, and if we'd taken a leaf out of their book back in the fifties and sixties and seventies, yes. we might still have a yes. bit of a bigger <laughs> industry Automotive ourselves. Industry. Yeah. But that's another story. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the battle that they're referring to was more about that union mem board member yeah. who, on behalf of his members was uncomfortable with the pace of change that Herbert Deese was, was pushing. Right. Okay. Oh, that's and therefore, you know, uh, and I'm not saying it's a less sophisticated outlook on things. It's, it's what it is. He is yeah. going to have his vested interest on his workers. And when you're asking people to prepare for not working in an engine plant anymore, because there won't be one, yeah. um, but their dad did and their grandfather did. Yeah. Um, but now they won't much longer and their son certainly or daughter yeah. certainly won't then then it's a different thing so yeah there's a kind of battle royal going on culturally socially and in many other ways i think in germany um and and, and they are very vexed by yeah. both what tesla have done yeah. and what the chinese have been doing in their own country and are now you know getting ever closer to come and they're, doing it in their own they're, backyard they're coming yeah they're coming oh yeah <laughs> Them Chinese cars are coming over the hill. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was that meant to be an American or Chinese accent? Well, that was meant to be American. That, that was that was <laughs> Slim Pickens. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that sounded yeah. I, I, I get it Very now. badly done. Yeah, um, I get it. So, so yeah, I mean, take another company, um, Daimler. So, I think it was last year, Ola Kalenius um, announced. And I know you might get excited by this and say it's too late, it's too far away, but 2039, they won't make any more internal combustion engines, right. full stop. Now, for the manufacturer, the inventor of that it's technology to say that was pretty big. Now, he would not have come out with that had they not already agreed with the unions some timeline to have this managed transition. Right. Right. Um, you know, so, so, so this stuff is... is is in all of those areas. It's not just what should we make that's better for the planet or even better for the environment, you know, air yeah. quality wise. It, it's, it's a bit more complex than that. And I'm not making excuses and I'm not saying so they should slow down and like, you know, take your time guys. I'm yeah. not saying that. Yeah. But all I'm saying is for, for, for some of the people who are in the kind of electric vehicle crowd, if you like, that say, you know, let's do everything tomorrow. Let's, yeah. ban, let's ban it in 2025. And, you know, just, just we've got to have a managed transition, yeah. not just, you know, go bloody gung-ho at the whole thing. Yeah. Well, it's also that you, it's important because, I mean, uh, that's the thing I've really been pushing myself to keep reminding myself and listeners and viewers is it's not just cars. You know, Daimler, a good example, they make vans and trucks. 
So if they're, you know, the Daimler car, we now know making an electric car that's viable is not that big a challenge. Making an electric van that's viable is just becoming not that big a challenge. A truck, it's still, you know, I think it's going to happen, but yes. that's going to take a lot longer. So you, when you're talking about a small, end, you know, like a four-cylinder, you know, two-liter engine, and you, and you remove that and you replace it with a battery and electronics and an electric motor, it's kind of, we've kind of got that down now. That's, that's well, you, done. you're going into an arena now that's triggered me to come out with, and I'd like anyone listening who can get exercise of this to maybe sit down, get ready for this. It's the H word, Rob. Yeah. Uh, Hydrogen. Yeah. Now, I know you, that's going to... I knew gonna, you I were going to start gonna, swearing. <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, if there's one thing I kind of learned when I was at Ricardo, because as you know, I I'm a complete charlatan when it comes to what do I really know. Yeah. I only know what I know from appropriating it from other people. Yes, me too. Right, you know? yeah, exactly. Stand next to someone clever and you become a little bit cleverer than yourself. <laughs> Try and absorb it. But most of it, I'm afraid, <laughs> exactly. runs off. Osmosis, you know, intelligence by yeah. osmosis. Yeah. Um, but so it's a, the thing I learned at Ricardo was, you know, be agnostic and yes. it's about application specific what yes. do you want something to do dictates what what should it do or you know what would the energy source power source be you know what was the dynamics to, to make it all come together so let's take a case in point aviation yeah you know we all bang on about cars and trucks and vans and buses but we've got shipping and we've got aviation yeah. which is hugely carbon intense so if we look at um taking some or maybe a lot of aviation into an arena where it's electric and more benign for the environment yeah. then maybe it is batteries but maybe it's hydrogen yeah. and i tell you why i'm confident it's hydrogen because only yesterday uh, a company and a thing i know we we've were been, keen to go and we've been see and record to see for a long time yeah but we got stymied <laughs> yeah. with all, all the stuff that's happened yeah um zero avia have just been invested in a considerable sum of money by right. Jeff Bezos and right. um, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Microsoft, Bill Gates. Right. So so that their venture fund into new and clean technologies. Um, so and and by the way, including the government, the UK government, we should right. take our hats off to yeah. the UK government, um, Innovate UK, investing money in Zero Avia to create that technology development here at right. Cranfield yeah. and, and with other people which has in turn triggered the big money from, you know, private money to come in, which now gives us a lovely momentum to the whole proposition. And, you know, you've got British Airways working now with Zero Avia. Right. Um, you've got, as I said, that big announcement yesterday with Series A funding of $37 million. Right. That's not a small amount of money. No, no. Um, and, and so that's an illustration of where hydrogen can be appropriate for um, flight. Uh, and, you know, we've been seeing it with, with trucks and buses a, as well. Um, so I, do, I don't think it, it is the, the, the kind of distraction that too many people suggest, oh, yeah, Shell and other governments and people are only going down the hydrogen route saying we've got a hydrogen economy as a distraction, as a delaying tactic yeah, to stop is, us yeah. developing batteries and having electric vehicles. Yeah. Really? Are you telling me that all these clever people around the world have signed a piece of paper saying, oh, okay, I'll keep stum and I'll yeah. mislead everybody if you give me 50 grand? Yeah. I mean, yeah. come on, let's get real. That yeah, is that not, not you know, how these things work. Um, I mean, I think there's an argument. You could make the argument that the reason that the big fossil fuel companies push hydrogen is because they can produce it. And they've got the marketing structure to sell it, you know. Of course can, it is. Because you know, they can produce it out of natural gas and they can then store it and put it in their existing filling station infrastructure. I mean, that is, that's reasonable. But even, that's good. I'd still rather cycle behind a hydrogen fuel. I've always said this. I'd rather cycle by, through a traffic jam full of hydrogen fuel cell cars and buses and trucks than I would today, which is diesel. You know, so I don't care. You know, that's, that's always been, well, 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 I've always remained neutral about that. Exactly. And of course, there's a traffic light of hydrogen. So what we all want to see is much more green hydrogen yeah. know, as opposed to blue hydrogen and gas and all the rest of it. Yeah. And um, what's the other color? Brown, I guess. Brown, I um, think, yeah. Yes. But, but none, nonetheless, when, when you look at the capabilities and, and technologies for things that are being developed now, um, uh, I, I have confidence there is a place for hydrogen in it. And, oh, God, and I, yeah. I'm not part of the battery mafia, as I no. call it. 
Whereas, you know, if you're, you're in some meeting, do you remember when we used to go to meetings when these yes. events, there'd be loads of people. There. Do you remember that, Rob? Yeah, I do. Um, I've got well, pictures. I've been to some of those places where if you, if you mention the word hydrogen, it's a bit like don't walk outside on your own, especially if it's dark, because yeah. like a bunch of people will grab hold of you and beat you up. Um, it is it's, ridiculous. Well, it's partly because of our good friend, Elon, Mr. Musk has, you know, he's done his sort of shtick about uh, few fool cells and all that stuff. He's very, but you know, that's, I don't, I'm not, I'm not bothered one with the other. I mean, the best coach, like luxury uh, passenger coach I've ever been on was a hydrogen fuel cell one, a, 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 a Hyundai. Yes. Bus. And it was brilliant. It was so fast. And, oh, yes, I, all the I, others and it was so smooth and really cool. I, I, do you know what? I, when you talk, it's like I, I, I can I can chart your life by episodes of fully charge. I think, oh yes, that was when you were in. Um, <laughs> that was episode yeah. one thirty seven. <laughs> yeah, it's quite funny. But, no, but, it's, but I mean, the because the, that's the other thing I think it's worth pointing out because we'll we will cover this on fully charge properly. It's going to be next year now. The Zero Avia plane. You know, there's lo there's lots of battery electric planes flying around, and they fly for like an hour or maybe even an hour and a half. And they really work because, you know, electric motors are really powerful and they spin the propellers and, they, and they're quieter. And like the one that flew, the, I think that was um, uh, not BAE, whoever it was, uh, Airbus made yes. the one that flew the channel. And I mean, that way, but this one flies, has done a, uh, how long far has it done? 500 miles, I think. Now. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the 500 miles proposition is the first one. It's going to go from 12 to 19 seats and, and so on and so forth. You, it's a much you know, bigger you, plane as well, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you can iterate the proposition, you know, up and up and up. Um, uh, you mentioned Elon Musk a moment ago. Now, I, uh, I said to Val when I, I had a little brief interview with him, which I filmed for, for LinkedIn, um, saying, when you've got this sorted, which, of course, you know, getting ever closer to, to really doing that, um, I said, why don't you fly Elon from Fremont, you know, down to Hawthorne sometime yeah. um, in the uh, uh, Zero, fuel yeah. cell hydrogen uh, aeroplane, air, air and then, then we can have a chat with him at the other end and, and, yeah. and see what he thinks. But, but, but there is a quote that he had years ago where, and I think it was where he, he coined that phrase, uh, hydrogen full cells and he said it's just not possible it won't happen well all i'd say to mr elon musk is there were people for decades who said you can't land a rocket back on the ground yeah it's just not possible, possible. it, it won't ever happen, ever happen. yeah Yes, and um, somebody's done that now um yeah. so you know in fact he did it of course we all know who did it um and i and i think this is the 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 exciting thing about where we are rob right now with with the world and, and humanity Anything is possible. Yeah. It's just an engineering problem. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, and again, I, I know it's much more than that geopolitical influence on yes, things, yeah. politics, all this other stuff. But to feed the world, to sustain humanity on the planet, to not destroy so many species, to keep the oceans, you know, as clean as they deserve to be and leave them in their natural state, all of these things are within are our grasp. Possible. Yeah. Um, so there you are. Because there's one more story I'd love to do, which I think is the really critically key thing. Anyway, Herbert Dees, Volkswagen. Good on. No, not Herbert. What's his name? Yeah, it's Herbert, Herbert. Dees. It's that Herbert. is his name. Yeah, Herbert Dees. Yeah, I think I've seen him talk, but I've never, I've never met him. I don't, I've not uh, had the honour. But there's this one which I think is so interesting: the New York Vehicle to Grid e school bus pilot program is a success, this is an electric story. But I just think this is really important because all the time I'm thinking about vehicle to grid systems and whether they really will make a difference. And you know, I talk to a lot of people ask about it because I've got a vehicle to grid. We were meant to film a, a vehicle to grid house yesterday and we, we had to call it all off and it's a normal story. So we will do it soon. But on that level, like a car in, a, in someone's garage and they can run their house off their car a bit and then they can sell a bit of electricity, it's good. And if it scaled up and there was a million cars, it makes a difference. But a, a thing like a school bus in America or the school bus that comes past our house every morning, picks up kids from over the road, they do, they do early in the morning, they start up and they do that run and they do a set mileage every day and then they go back to the depot and they're there all the time. Particularly in America, those buses aren't used for anything else. And then in the afternoon, they do that run again and they go back to the depot. They've got, there's now hundreds of electric versions of this. They've got huge batteries and they use a vehicle to grid system in their depot where they're all plugged in. 
so that the grid has access to effectively many megawatts of instantaneous power to balance the grid. And then you see, ah, oh, that when that was a diesel vehicle, it sat in that yard completely useless, utterly doing nothing. It, I mean, it, it, was, it, was, it was a dumb asset, which yeah. um, I remember having a big argument with my wife uh, a, a few years ago, and that's exactly what she called me, <laughs> a dumb asset. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell my wife that term because I know it will be it will come back to bite me. It's yeah. great term. <laughs> you dumb asset. Yeah. You did. That's what she called me. But she's from Yorkshire, so they, right. they can be very visceral up there, Rob. You know, they they come out it's just they can be hurtful. But I mean yeah. Well, because I've been married 36 years, so somehow it works. My wife's Australian, and it's well known around the world that Australian women are the most timid, retiring wallflowers. (laughs) They never, never stand up for themselves. They they all believe Mm. men are better Mm. just before they land a very ferocious left hook. Yeah. I can imagine it. (laughs) Um, anyway, yeah, but that I just think that is a, that uh, that's what I kind of excites me about this. That in a, in that kind of the door that opened for me with electric vehicles was they're not cars like we know them, or they're not you know they are they're a whole other thing that we haven't we still haven't really understood. I think the the full potential of what they represent. Yeah, you know, batteries I think, on wheels, basically, aren't they? Right? I think you're absolutely right. And when you've talked to people like Graham Cooper at National yeah. Grid and all these other things, you know, the journey of um, um, renewable uh, adoption and accelerating renewable use is predicated on storage, on yeah. some capability somewhere, whether it's batteries or something else, yeah. um, to you know be that buffer to 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 aggregate what you've got in one place at a certain time uh, for use another place at a different time um and you know the battery stock being developed um in vehicles whether they're in buses or trucks or vans or whatever theory you know in principle theoretically absolutely is going to do that job there's yeah. no doubt about it i think one of the challenges though is in a lot of domestic properties in many countries in the world the capability within that house to yeah. feed you know energy back through substations and effectively in, back into the grid is a little bit trickier than, than maybe we think. But where you talk about commercial applications and business facilities and all those other things, that's, I would imagine, much more scalable. But listen, I'm not, I'm not, an, I'm not even an electrician, let alone you know, a, a real expert in any of this stuff. The only shout out I'd definitely give, Rob, would be to Nissan, because Nissan have been advocates yeah, of this for many, many years. And I'm sure you can recall going to things I don't know, five, 10 years ago, maybe even longer, where they were talking then about vehicle to grid and they yeah. were you know, imagining that over time, once we had this massive stock of, of vehicles, which you, know, you can connect up the batteries yeah. in effect, um, that this would be a crucial part of the journey to, to mass adoption of, um, of renewable energy. Yeah. Uh, so, so all credit to them because I sometimes feel sorry for both, actually both Nissan and Renault to a certain extent, and, and maybe BYD, if you put them together. It's yeah. Tesla that get all the glory yeah, yeah. for everything oh, that goes so on. Yeah. But, you know, lots of other people have done stuff, and, and definitely Nissan, Renault, and, and BYD, um, you know, have been at it a long time too. Yeah. I mean, because that's the simple sum I worked out in one of those discussions, actually with Graham. And I, I said this, and he laughed, but he said, well, I suppose it's not impossible is it just in a fantasy world, we convert all the vehicles that are currently on the road now to electric. And if, if they could be all plugged in at once, which they can't, it, that will never happen. But if they could, that is 1.5 petawatts of petawatt hours of storage. So if we, there's 30 million vehicles on the road now, and if they all had about a 50 kilowatt hour battery, some are gonna have much bigger, some slightly smaller. But if you think of that, it's, a, it's a roughly, this is a real rough, but that gives you some idea of what is, there is the potential there. That if you had 1.5 petawatt hours, that is what we use in about a year. This is the thing. It becomes such a, you then go, oh, hang on. So you're never going to have that. But say you've got 10 million cars that are actually plugged into vehicle to grid systems. That is very plausible. Yes. That is a phenomenal, that is many, many uh, gigawatt hours of, of, of the potential for the national grid to draw on. Yes. And you're only no. taking one kilowatt hour out of each car in reality. You're taking three or four miles, you know, in a crisis, you take three or four miles range out of 10 million cars. doesn't make any difference to the 
drivers or where you go. You know, it's not like you're not draining the battery. But that stuff is, you know, the two or three people I've spoken to about that, they are very keen on that. But that is, I think, 10 years minimum before well, that infrastructure is sort of... Common. Well, I, 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 yes, I think it is, Rob. But I, and we're friends, but I'm going to upset you now because I'm okay. going to say something you may have heard me say before, but we're not going to see mass adoption of electric cars. And I don't think we should. And, and, and the other day, it was a, a FT no, I, Live. I, I'm with you, actually. You're not going well, to upset me. I'm with it. But I'm still, I will be upset just for the sake of it. How dare you? <laughs> Thank you. But, but the, the reason why I say this, you know, without going on about the whole thing, but Martin Rimac, um, last week or the week before, was talking, being interviewed um, uh, by the FT, uh, Future of the Car Summit, very, very good I I interview. Right. Um, and he said, look, look, he was asked about battery technology. He said, it doesn't matter. He, yeah. he said, There's, we don't need five, six, seven, eight hundred mile range. He no. said, for people that occasionally do it. So battery technology will be about fleet operation, yeah. will be about specific vehicle types to do a particular job. So when you have a 30 mile battery, that's a vehicle that does 30, 30 miles, miles regularly yeah. and can't or won't do any more. Yeah. And that's fine. Um, but to build things, you know, ownership dictates compromise. The moment yeah. you buy an estate car, that's what you've got. Yeah. So you go to the shops in it, and yes, you go on holiday in it. Yeah. But for many of the other times, it's a, you, you know you don't need it. Need yeah. it. Um, yeah. And you know, I, I think this whole pursuit then of SUVs. Look at how many oh. SUVs are mostly just what just the driver, yeah. um, rarely with a load of stuff in the back of them. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with an SUV as such, but you should have an SUV when you need an SUV, yeah. Yeah. not all the time. When you're taking six people and a load of stuff with you up somewhere wild, yes, then it yes. makes sense. Exactly. Which is once um, or twice a lifetime, you know, or certainly, or once a year, you know, you do not need it to go down the shops, which is what people use it for. Exactly. And this goes right back to what we talked very early on in this conversation about scale. It's all yeah, about, yeah. Scale. it's all the fact that the world has changed because there's more people with more stuff. Yeah. So it's the more stuff and more people that's the issue. Yeah. And, and we can't say to everybody, please go and live on the moon or Mars, you know, yeah. two or three billion people. That's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, God forbid a pandemic comes and does you know, a lot worse than this, this yeah. one has. So what we have to do is engineer our way out of being much more efficient and, yeah. and maximize the utilization of assets and maximize efficiency. That's the yeah. key word in all of where we are, Rob, and, and where we're going is efficiency. Yeah, yeah. Now, you're absolutely right, and you are right about that. And, I mean, it was a ridiculous conversation because that was the exactly the thing graham said so we're talking about a, a, an extraordinary engineer for those over uh, outside the uk an extraordinary engineer that is a very kind of big spokesperson at the national grid at our our, our national grid about uh, the adoption of electric vehicles drives an electric car himself he understands the impact that a lot of electric vehicles but his whole his whole shtick and yours and mine is that that i've got there's a car sitting on the other side of the wall behind me that ain't doing nothing <laughs> and I'm paying for it, and I'm not yep. using it, and I won't use it today. I'm using it tomorrow, but I didn't use it yesterday. You know, yeah. just sit there for most of the time. I've got it, and I'm paying for this ridiculous piece of really expensive equipment. What the hell am I doing? Why isn't someone else using it now? Yeah, yeah you know, but you know I'll what, Rob? I, I think that that realization is profound now all yeah. around the world this year because of all these lockdowns. Yes. Where, where people, you know, the money comes out of the bank, you're 300, 400, 500, yeah. or how, however much it is least, a month for your car. Month, and you think, yeah. but, I, but it hasn't moved. Yeah. I didn't go anywhere. Yes. You know, uh, and, and yeah. I think, it, yeah, yeah, that's hit, hit home with a lot yeah. of people, perhaps more than at any other time before. Yeah. Um, I mean, I so, think it's generational. I think our, like your and my generation, are going to have difficulty adjusting. We've grown up with the notion of a privately owned vehicle. You know, our, my car is a thing. But I think young, I mean, I'm hoping because of that experience of, of uh, you know, renting bikes, renting scooters, renting all, and just using it when you want it, uh, an Uber and all those things, you don't, you're buying a service, not a product. And I think that I, we both sat in more seminars than we can poke a stick at where that's been discussed in depth. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know if you got, now you did mention early on that you had another topic, but was that? about the, the, the girl, the, the air pollution story about... Yes, uh, it, it, it was. Yeah. I, I felt it would have just... We couldn't not talk about no, her. it's very and, much in the know, news at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Um, but again, just coming back to, um, you know, where are we and what, what sort of happens next? I do think that this pandemic uh, it will 
change many, many things. If yeah. you look at the history of pandemics, they do. It's right. not just, oh, let's go back to normal. We yeah. will, you know, we're going to get through it. So yeah. I wouldn't want anyone to totally freak out. Um, we will, you know, this time next year, um, we won't be going around masks. We won't be having yeah. a lockdown Christmas, et cetera, et cetera. However, it will have fundamentally changed yeah. many, many things. And actually, ironically, I think many things for the better. Yeah. I think we yeah. will be, you know, less focused on going all around the world. I've done that too much. Me too. And, yeah, you know, absolutely. and I kind of think, oh, as soon as we can fly again, oh, should I go there? Should I go, go there and go there and do yeah. this and do that? I think, okay, I'll be honest. I would like to go to one. There are a couple of places I have never been and would like yeah. to go. But I'm kind of thinking I really have to take stock of this a lot better now. Yeah. Not not in the public thing of, you know, because I have people on LinkedIn or you do yeah. YouTube stuff. You've got to do it for your own conscience. Yes, um, yes. it's not, it's not and about I, and what I, you look like or what people think of you. It's yes, about what you, you know, what you, feel you know what you've done right or wrong. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, if, if you're a bit more in the public sort of um, domain, then, then, you know, you have got to practice what you preach. Yeah. Um, and is that going to be hard for you, you know, filming around the world and all the rest of it? Well, really? of course it is. Yeah. But you can, you know, there's another thing. I saw the other day, by the way, I don't know why I'd never seen this before. I'm embarrassed to admit it, to be honest with you. You can completely offset your carbon footprint. You can, you know, where was it? It's an app. You can get an right. app and, it, and you put in exactly what you do, how much you travel, how much you drive, you right. know, what your sort of diet is, what your electricity bills and all this sort of stuff. And it comes up with a figure, um, an organization sort of put it together. Um, I think it's all kosher, but it's essentially then, you know, you've got to pay 25 quid a month or something to right. offset your carbon. Um, I should know a bit more about it. Right. I just briefly explained it, but <laughs> well, sorry about that. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I kind of thought, okay, th th this could help alleviate some of my guilt complex um, and if it really is a material, substantial thing that yeah. makes a difference, then then actually I should do it. It's like a carbon tax, Rob. That's yes. basically what it is, yes. a carbon yeah. tax. Right, right. Yeah, no, it is difficult, isn't it? Because, I mean, the the slow journey, I mean, I'm now getting it right down, the, my, uh, the, the amount of, because st I still burn fossil fuel. The, our house is still heated with uh, um, LPG. Right, because we're not on mains gas here, so we, but I mean that would still be a fossil fuel. But you know, this this year my, it was my absolute aim this year to get an electric boiler. You can get a replacement boiler. You don't have to replace your whole heating system, and you have an, and I haven't managed to do it. So, but everything else, water heating, cooking, everything, lighting, everything is done on the most economic and most via you know low carbon way except for that you know and you think well i'm supposed and i've got electric cars and i've got solar panels and batteries i still got a bloody gas boiler yeah because that's well, the technology we've all we've all been using you know yeah but that's because you live out in the middle of the nowhere and, and on that note my little phone ping thing came when you were doing your 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 um oh yes my little walk tweet. my waffle this morning yeah i hope i hope i've rechristened it for you i'd call it a podcast no podcast like is good <laughs> like that <laughs> A podcast. Yeah, I'm going to do podcast. more podcasting. Yeah, I mean, you don't have to be a policeman to do a podcast. No, you can, no, no. You can do it, you know, yourself. But <laughs> well, I did do uh, sixteen thousand steps this morning. Yes, That's which is about. I say, the thing is, it's it's about twelve, just over ten miles, I suppose. How long does that take you to do that? Oh, bloody ages. <laughs> it's much a couple of hours. Because my wife, yeah, oh, uh, more uh, two and a half hours probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I take the dogs out um, any time between for an hour or two hours, depending on, you know, when I can find yeah. a, a bit of a slot to go and do it. Um, but I've got to say, you know, for, for this year, that, that's been massively helpful for yeah, me, yeah. by the way. Do you remember this this moment? <laughs> what was that? Oh, that was with your hat. That, that, that was when we did, um, when we had a little well, chat. Um, yes. Oh, it was Tesla battery day. That's right. Because we, right, we yes. stayed up to like midnight, didn't we? That's right. <laughs> yes. So, so that was cool. And, and by the way, this other one I'm showing, I don't oh, know, that's cool. people, this is a podcast, so people can't see these. It's not very right, good to no. tell you, is it? Um, so that's at Charge Cars uh, with, with, with Mark, really smart right. guy. Um, you should definitely do, oh, I don't, have you done an episode with them yet? No. With the uh, Mustang? No. Oh, yes, but we know about it, it, but we haven't done it yet. No. 
Yeah, you know, you know please do because yeah, no, that, what they that's... do is they, they, they don't gut a car and chuck bits away because that, that wouldn't be right. But they basically take a 1967 um, uh, body panel it's of a Ford Mustang. My, I mean, I'm, and, I shouldn't admit it, but it is my favourite car. Oh, it's... I it's, drove one in Los Angeles. It was just fabulous. It's glorious, but fully electrified. And it because be they're then yeah. part of a rival, of course, right, and yeah. Robo Race, this is a very interesting way in which you've got cross pollination of technology, yeah. people, ideas, etc., to make each bit of those three businesses move really quickly, yeah. which I think is why UPS bought a load of uh, vans. I love the episode you went and did at Banbury with them, yeah, by the way. Great. That. Amazing. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, it look, looks extraordinary. And, and the whole thing of, Again, they're tackling things so differently and radically, you know, having micro factories rather than yes. building great big plants, yeah. using different construction techniques rather than the yeah. traditional ones, you know, making everything more efficient. Yeah. That's the stuff yeah. they're really good at. And, um, and recyclable. I mean, they're all, because we talked a lot about that, the circular economy, the notion that you build something that lasts as long as it possibly can do, and then you make sure it's made of materials you can use again, which is, you know, kind of obvious we should have yes, been doing it, it for the last hundred years and i've just had the thought rob you know you mentioned milton Keynes earlier on being yeah. you know quite an advanced place well think about it rob just think about what you said circular economy yeah what has milton Keynes got lots of roundabouts roundabouts <laughs> see they there uh, you they, always they, you always manage to suck me and i'm going jesus roger's going to come up with the most brilliant thing i must go along with it and then I went, oh, bloody circular economy, roundabouts. There you go, there roundabouts. There. So they've got a very circular economy. Yes, roundabouts, <laughs> it's the future. <laughs> it's the magic. Do you remember the magic roundabout? I, I tell do. you something, I don't know how they got away with that back in the day because Brian Thompson, especially the character Dylan and whatever, yeah. but the magic roundabout was um, that, that kids' programme in the 19... Well, I suppose it was... It was actually a French... Uh, it was a French animated thing that was revoiced for the UK. So it was completely. You're kidding different. me. Don't yeah, it was say made that. in France. It You've was ruined my childhood. It was, it was uh, uh, I can't remember. I, I remember seeing it in Paris. And I went, oh my God, oh, I didn't know you'd had, uh, uh, you know, Magic Roundabout here. And they went, it is French. How dare you? It's oh, no, come on. That's so just he because... revoiced it. He wrote the. He wrote the uh, Nigel Planer did a documentary. When, when I was making an episode, uh, making Red Dwarf at Shepperton, I went into another studio and there's Nigel Planer with a giant Florence Dougal. And if you don't know these, you're not from the UK or France, you must Google the magic <laughs> round round. You'll see these amazing animated puppets. Dougal the dog, Dylan the stoned hippie rabbit. Oh, completely off his head. And the way that was portrayed, it was like, oh, hello, man. Oh. You know, like it may as well have had a massive doobie. <laughs> <laughs> and Flo hey, you're quite right. And Florence was the little girl who went on the magic roundabout. And uh, what was the snail called? Brian. Brian. Brian the snail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, look, it was the magic Very roundabout serious. was, yeah. it was, a, Rob, it was ahead of its time. It see, was. magic roundabout, circular economy. You see what circular I'm doing economy. here? They could Making see it all together. into the future. They knew what was coming. Yeah. They did indeed. Yeah. Um, well, well, look, again, I would just like to say something to you, which I, I might have said once or twice, but I would like to say, for the benefit of listeners, really, as right. much as you. Um, thank you for what you do, what you do with the rest of the team. Y yes, you get, you know, you have to work hard to get sponsors for some of these things, but you do it in exactly the right way, very professional way. Right. Right. The fact that you do all of this work and have done it for years for f and put it up there, you know, for free, yeah. I think is extraordinary. I think you should be... You know, you should genuinely feel proud of yourself. I know you, the job's not done. It's an ongoing it's thing, et cetera. But <laughs> the fact that you bother yeah. to do it, Rob, you could go yeah. and do something else. You know, you, you've established a bit of celebrity. You do your thing. I'm sure you could get lots of other much more lucrative work or lucrative work at all, yeah. at all rather than, you know, this thing that you believe in, this passion that you hold and the fact that you, you know, you toil away at it working so hard um, and you are getting on a bit. So, you're not, you know, the fact you're not slowing down, that's all good too. Um, but no, I, on behalf of everybody that, that oh, I, well, very that kind thinks this I, way, I want to thank you and salute you. Here's, well, here's a good. ginger beer to all ginger you do. Beer. I really appreciate it, Roger. Thank you very much. No, that's very kind of you. But I mean, I think I, I accept it and I'm, because I'm very, I find that sort of stuff very hard to deal with, but I do accept it. But I also, the only, uh, 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 additional to that is that it's 
it's been incredibly rewarding in every aspect other than financial you know yeah. i mean it's been such a it's become such a, a a key part of my life now it's like a sort of central focus uh, i suppose you know that which is great so i'm very grateful to have had that opportunity even if i might have carved it out myself or whatever it's the the fact is that the subject has pulled me along if you if you know what i mean it's not like, which is nothing to do with me or anything i've done that the actual technology that i took an interest in and i think you're the same you know 10 years ago could have gone could have fizzled out and gone to nothing and actually it's exponentially expanding and it's fascinating and it's challenging difficult it's not it's not a perfect answer but it's a fascinating story to follow so that is a great benefit but but I've I've neither known you or known of you for a very long time, and I know even when you did that thing with the Joeys, that band you had those those you know your yeah. three friends. I know one of them isn't here anymore, but you you know you have that song um, uh, about women's rights. You know, yeah. um, um, men have men have willies, men have bums, men are good at science and sums, all, all that one. Um, so you've always had that thing, and I've always. Uh, Talk to my, my sons and they because they love Scrap Heap Challenge. Right. Do you think what Scrap Heap Challenge was about? No, it's about that recycling. Had a huge impact. Yeah. It's about yeah. reuse and recycling. Yeah. You know, it, it was yeah, it was fun. You had a laugh. You made you know crazy stuff. But yeah. essentially, it was about not throwing things away. Yeah. And finding a way to, to use things in, in a different thing. Now I don't know how long ago that was. 15, 20 years ago, it was, Rob. Well, it finished. Tw uh, where are we? Twelve years ago, I suppose. 12, right. Thirteen years ago. So yeah, we did it for ten years. And it yes, was about twelve years ago. But but that's that's a pretty much a similar theme, and very much now the contemporary focus, which is to reuse and recycle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and 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 that that was that was a great show. So you you know, mate, you've got form. Whether yeah. you want to go and do something else anyway, you can't because you've got form in all I've this got to stuff do now. This. So yeah, you're. No, um, I'd like to do yeah. puppet shows. I'd like to make no. the magic roundabout. <laughs> 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 yeah, I tell you what we could do. How about make it make an episode of the Magic Roundabout on a roundabout in Milton Keynes? Yes, yeah, with but a solar powered entertainment that'd be good. An electric roundabout. It's about powered time by the, the sun. It's yeah. about time the fairground industry caught up with the twenty first century, started using <laughs> solar to power their their roundabouts. Wouldn't that be cool to have solar powered bumper? Because I love bumper cars. You know, the, well, I was in the. Dodgers. I went to. Have you ever been to the Isle of Wight? I went to the Isle of Wight for the yeah. first time this year on uh, the Sandown Pier. At the right. end of the pier, they've got a bumper cars. Oh, have they? Well, no, I've not been there. Well, so like all, like all summer long, you can go there. Well, I guess so. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and but bumper cars. I yes, I, I'm. I've always thought. You see, you know, I like wireless charging. You know, we, we can have a version of bumper cars with wirelessly charged. In effect, you know that that would that would be ideal. Now, I haven't talked about wireless charging. I'm not going to go off on one, but I All would right. like to leave you with this one thought. Okay. Um, probably end of January now because we've been getting COVID in the way, but we will have 25 electric Jaguar I paces running at high power wireless charged. Um, as taxis in Oslo. In Oslo, uh, right. At the oh, end so of are they not operating? I thought they were already operating. Are they, no, are they well, the cars are out there, but, yeah, you know, yeah. getting all the, right. the, the, the ground, ground works done and yeah. all the rest of that stuff is it, it, all been underway with an amazing team from Jaguar and from Fortum and from Cab Online, the, the taxi company, and, and these right. these guys in America, at, uh, Momentum Dynamics, that, that you know, I, I, I work with. Right. Uh, because I'm a big believer in it. Um, and that'll be around, they'll be charging up between 50, 60 kilowatts, uh, right. those vehicles, charging in situ when they're in the taxi rank Isn't waiting for a ride. Yeah. Yeah. As they don't have to go off somewhere else and they yeah. can go and plug in as well if they want right. to, but you know, what we're hoping is they won't need to. Yeah. Um, so m maybe, you know, depending upon what's happening in the first quarter of next year, I mean, that, that might be quite an exciting episode. Oh, to film. I'd love um, to do it. Oh, and I was so, so amazed when I heard about that. Because it's sort of, you know, I went to, I think you may have seen as well, when I think it was Renault did it. The, it was Renault, yeah. A strip of, of sort of high-speed induction charging road, which is all that stuff that's like really exciting. And then you think, that is going to be a while before that is installed. You know, you've got to dig up a motorway and put in $100 million worth. But whereas a taxi rank with, you know, I've, we've all seen the, you know, I mean, you and I would have seen a simple induction charging plate that you can sit under the road. That's a much easier, you know, at a place where a taxi stops while it's waiting. Well, well exactly. So much and, sense. And 
you know, the journey that it's been on wireless charging, um, in the same fashion, you could argue that charging has, has been on. You mentioned some of those things earlier on now. Unless you're at 50 kilowatts or more, you're not really at the races. You yeah. know, OK, you can charge overnight at home when you've got all the time, yeah. you know, at 7.2 or, or whatever, I mean, 11 if you're lucky. Um, but, it's, but essentially, the, 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 the fast charge capability is the important one to have it for high yeah. utilization vehicles like buses, taxis and vans and to try and deliver it to them in situ where they yeah. don't need to go off their, their kind of job, you know, yeah. what, what, what they're doing. So it isn't that wireless charging is going to be a panacea. It's not going to like, oh, that's it. That's yeah. the only way we do it. Um, I, I think for the short term and maybe for, you know, another decade or so, this will be an appropriate way in which we charge up lots of vehicles like yeah. taxis, buses and vans. Yeah. And then we can have smaller batteries on them because yes. they don't need the battery on board because mm. they've got, the range through the infrastructure. Yeah, yeah. No, it is all those things. I mean, I remember seeing that a long time ago, which was an electric Golf. So before the e-Golf came out in a car park in Stuttgart or somewhere like that, and we all, all the journalists stood in the middle. Of, and it was just so funny because you'd, you'd appreciate it because it was a, 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 a sort of corporate person in the car got out and did casual walking away from the car so the whole idea was <laughs> you get you you take your car into a car park you get out and leave it and it it just drives itself so we were seeing this autonomous car and the guy did this really bad like phone acting he was like walking along talking on his phone like you do <laughs> but it's just yeah. the way he did it made me laugh anyway that's irrelevant so he then walked in front of he then the car went around in a big circle to go and park and he walked in front of it and it stopped and didn't run him over. It was like, that's what we were being shown. But then it drove into a car park space and we watched it do it and you could hear it. It drove forward on a, a, an angled car park space and it went beep, beep, and it stopped and it was charging. Then, no, not being plugged in or anything. Because yeah. they also had a mechanical arm, which was, I got in trouble because I said that's the campest thing I've ever seen. So the way <laughs> this arm moved was really sort of like a, like a Larry Grayson, like a very camp drag queen. And, yeah. plugged, and actually plugged in a seven kilowatt, you know, type two charger into a Golf. <laughs> and of course, German engineers who've designed this amazing thing that could see where the hole was and adjust itself. But it was just the way that it went. <clears throat> but anyway, induction charging, that was probably eight, nine years ago I saw that. And so, well, you know, all these things. Great with that stuff. Yeah, these things have to go through iterations and yeah. deal with some challenges. But, 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 but that, that's where we are now. Just, just another thought. You've reminded me of something talking about running over things and, and actually roundabouts i once drove into brackley in the summertime windows open and stupidly i had my mobile phone on the edge of the door i can't remember right. why i did rather than somewhere sensible yeah and as i got to the roundabout that you get in just as you come into brackley near the mercedes uh, formula one headquarters um, as i go round the roundabout my phone fell out of the window right so I, and, and it wasn't, it wasn't busy. I don't know what time of the day it was. There wasn't too much yeah. traffic around. So I thought, no problem. I'll just carry on driving around and, and you know, jump out, pick it up. Uh, but I, I didn't calculate no, quite very well. Roads. I drove round and ran my own phone over. <laughs> <laughs> so then I stopped the car with the hazards on and I thought, oh. well, I'll have to get it. So I get out and it's just smashed to bits. And I yeah. thought, who runs over their own phone? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What an idiot. I think I might have done. I've got a feeling I've done that. Something very similar. The one I loved, I think, I know, I know what I saw was, um, uh, it was beautiful. It was a display in an Australian computer shop 10, 15 years ago, because I went in to get a battery or something for my laptop. I can't even remember. And, the, and it was in their kind of glass cabinet. And it was like at a museum display. So it had sand and uh, we, uh, wheel tracks and uh, like a bit of bush and a, and a rubber snake. And then this mashed up laptop, like crushed and with rocks rammed into it. And what the guy had done is he, he put his laptop on the, on the tire, but underneath the mudguard so he could see it because it was in the bright <laughs> sun out in the desert to do the, whatever he was testing. He was, I think it was a mobile phone mouse. It was something to do with mobile phones. And uh, then he went, ah, oh, yeah, mate. And then he was on the phone. And then he got in the car and drove off. So the, the laptop got so mashed up. But the reason they'd done this was they got the data off it. They were very proud that they'd managed to extract a totally mashed up hard drive and get the data out of it. Because it, well, it would have been a, you know, a laptop of the era. But it was just a beautiful, the way they'd done this thing. It was like a, a, a beautiful museum exhibit. It was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Well, I've smashed up too many things over the years. Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't yeah. have done, but you know, 
but but there, there we are. Yeah, the one I did, which is the only equivalent to that, is cut up some old um, chicken, fen- not chicken fencing, sort of fencing wire to to put it in the bin to get rid of this damn stuff. And I'd been it had been in the garden for years, and I was trying to get rid of it, and I left. I didn't know some bits of it on the gravel, so you didn't see them. They're not beat like little bits of wire with some very sharp, prongy Ouch. things. So you then reverse your luxury Tesla with its very expensive tires. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I well, punctured my own tires. Well, you should have been more focused. Can I? Can I just add uh, one more quick thing? Yeah. Um, how do? How do I and how, how do you and how do other people who are, you know, like us sort of focused on EV, um, talk to people that aren't? How yeah. do we avoid being in an echo chamber, Rob? H- how do we, you know, um, find people who are contrarians, p- find people who hate electric vehicles, find people who don't want them? H- how do we put ourselves in uncomfortable environments to talk about, you know, what, what, what we do. I mean, we can, yeah. it'd be pompous to say and change people's minds, yeah. but, but just, just tell the story. They can make their own mind up. Yeah. But, but how do we get out of just being in the comfortable place where we're all around each other saying, oh, yes, you're right. Oh, we're right. Oh, we're, yeah. you know, we've been right all along. You know, how, how do we get out of that? I mean, I don't, I mean, the th- I think the f- feeling I get now is, because it's all those clever, uh, cleverer people that I have that, have, that design those graphs of, of technology adoption. So Tony Sieber, people like Tony Sieber, you know, come up with a, you know, look at the, what happened with the telephone or the fridge, refrigerator or the television yeah. or the radio. You know, and there's this very well documented sort of academic study of how people adopt new technologies. You know, they resist it first, then, they, then there's the early adopters, then there's the, you know, all those things. It feels to me like now, if someone is vehemently anti-electric cars for whatever reason, there's no, there's, there's kind of no need to try and convince them or to, I, I, you know, I've really kind of withdrawn from sort of arguing because I go, it's fine. I just say like on Twitter, that's the only time I would interact with that. I'll occasionally get someone who will see something I've retweeted and gone, well, that was ridiculous. And what about your batteries? They're made of toxic materials that children do. And I always, I now say, don't buy one, stick with your diesel. Yeah. It's fine. It doesn't matter because you're the, you know, I don't actually say you're the minority because now most people are going, even if they're not going to do it for five years ago, I know my next car will be electric or I'm waiting for the second hand market to develop. And I think that is, you know, the the people who are still vociferously opposed for whatever, some sort of philosophical reason, I can't quite understand it, Um, which is fine, you know, and I want the glory of my internal combustion engine. It's it's fine. Don't, you know, it doesn't worry me at all. I've always want, I want, like my friend Chris Barry, who's in Red Dwarf, loves his classic cars and he polishes them and he mm. you know, buffs his carburettors. If, he, if people like Chris, if there's 10,000 people who drive a fabulous, beautifully maintained classic petrol cars, so what? It's like having, uh, you know, steam engines. Now. We've got a, a, an old steam engine line near our house where they still run steam engines. And, you, you know, if, if all our rail transport was still running on steam, we'd have major issues with coal pollution and yeah. you know, all that. Well, it's, it's one steam train. It's lovely. I love seeing the steam train. Yeah, it's it, it, it's, it, it is about scale. Oh, by yeah. the way, um, I was talking to Simon Moores earlier, and it, it, I wrote down, he had a message for you. He oh, said, right. tell Rob his tentacles have extended into the industry. <laughs> Now, I don't know if you knew that. I, I don't know if you, do you feel uncomfortable? Are you aware that happened, Rob? I'm not aware, but it does sound a bit disturbing. Didn't realise no. it was an octopus. But, but I think w- what he means, and of course, his stuff, Simon Moores, the guy from Benchmark Mineral Intelligence, yeah, yeah. who's talked to the, you know, the US uh, Senate on um, energy and is becoming very, very influential. Um, what he means by that is the work that I mentioned earlier that you've been doing a long time with the team. I know you, right. you was, you're very focused on it being a team thing. Yeah. Um, have had probably more of an impact that, than you realise. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's impossible to tell. I can't yes. tell. But I so, think so, I've, so, I've been told before, I think you're probably, there is some, I accept there's some truth in that. Yes, so, so, so please don't withdraw your tentacles. No, uh, they're, no. they're out there yeah. um, and, and they're doing their thing, which is really good. So yeah. as long as it doesn't give you any discomfort, um, just, just carry on tentacling. Yeah. I just I always, because I always want to explain who these people are. So Benchmark Minerals, just extraordinary research group, aren't they? Who yes. actually 
analyze the the quantity and the the, the location the cost and what's going on in the, with basically the minerals that are going into battery manufacturing primarily i mean i think they they would have pre-existed the the exploding battery market now so they probably did stuff that was about stainless steel production or aluminium but now they've really kind of focused on on battery yeah. stuff so benchmark mineral intelligence i believe is there that's correct name. but so rob I don't want to pick. People. I don't want to pick you up on your words, but please don't say exploding battery business. You know, <laughs> <laughs> especially with the Coda recall. Well, you know, um, th th yes, in, yeah. in, indeed. Let, let's not let's not get ourselves in a go down yeah, a rabbit more. hole, as, the, as yeah. it were. But anyway, um, that is uh, Roger. I just want to thank you very much because you are always you always cheer me up and you're always inspirational and we shouldn't go on too much you know, mutual adoration or anything, but you know, it's been, it's been brilliant to talk to you. You've kind of pushed, you've pushed me in different directions, which is wonderful. And uh, long may you continue to do what you do. Cause you've just got, I mean, I'm going to explain it again to our listeners. Uh, how many, just tell me how many people follow you on LinkedIn. This is a totally different thing, but it's a lot. Um, oh, I'll tell you, I'll have a look. Oh yeah, have a look. Okay. I want the exact number. <laughs> yes, uh, bear with me. Um, it's 290 something thousand. Right. Um, 291,559. And I, I'd like to say thanks to all of them because, yeah. you know, it, it's very flattering. You know, I'm an old bloke um, with grey hair. Uh, not fat, but get in that way. Um, <laughs> so to f have that many people follow you, think, yeah. you know... But that's I mean, the, the, the critical do. thing of that is that's mostly people in the energy automotive yes, yes, industry, you know, so it's yeah. very, you know, that's a, you know, really important to the fact that you're tied in with all those people. I learn an enormous amount from you whenever I see you or whenever I read anything you've said or to, to anything. So that's, so I'm very grateful you've taken well, thank you. That's very kind. Thank you. On, on the pod, as they say, as the, as the, as the, as the I was going to say, as the young people say, they don't say that. They're just, We've got they're no awesome. idea what they no, say. I don't know what they say, and I shouldn't no. know. So no. no, it's a secret. They don't want us to know. If we start no. saying it, they'll change it and really won't say that thing anymore. I, yeah, yeah. I can remember my dad saying um, uh, something about Led Zeppelin. I can't remember what it was, but it immediately made me not. I've, I've never been able to really love Led Zeppelin ever since then. I, I just, if so, he would have come into my bedroom when I've got Led Zeppelin playing and going, Led Zeppelin, heavy rock. <laughs> my dad did, this is spooky. My dad used to call them Zed Zeppelin and he knew what they were called right. and he would say it every time on purpose. And, <laughs> and when you were of a certain age, you just take the bait every time. Yeah, yeah. He'd go, Zed Zeppelin, da 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 da. I said, yeah. Dad, it's Led Zeppelin. It's not Zed Zeppelin. Yeah, Zed Zeppelin, da 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 da. And I think, idiot. Yeah. Well, I really hope you enjoyed that. If you want to follow um, uh, uh, Roger on Twitter, for example, he's on at Sid Atkins, S-I-D-A-T-K-I-N-S, at Sid Atkins. Uh, and he's always in the most, uh, well, generally uh, up until this year, you know, I just see pictures of him with everyone that you've ever heard of that has anything to do with electric cars. Extraordinary guy. He gets around, really knows his topics, as you can tell. Um, just really want to do a, a quick a heads up just to announce that we are definitely doing, in 2021, Fully Charged Live at uh, Farnborough Airfield in June and Fully Charged Live Europe in Amsterdam in uh, end of September. I believe that's when it is. I will make sure the dates are very clearly um, illustrated. Uh, and you can get, if you go on our web page, uh, fullycharged.show, you will see everything there. And also, there was another thing I was going to mention, Patreon. And yeah, yeah, I don't want to go on about that too much. But if you're interested, uh, there's a link to that. And there's a link to most, to all the stories we talked about, all but one, I think. Uh, there are links to that in the show notes for this podcast. I should have said that at the beginning, but I didn't. So I'm saying it now. That's, that's it. As always, if you have been, thank you for listening.